OK, um, so hello everyone and thanks Saskia for that introduction. So I am now a, a PhD student going into my third year and I'm just going to do the next talk. So talk to you a little bit about my um, chemistry journey <clears throat> and then also a bit about my research and the work that I'm doing. So to start with uh, an introduction about who I am. Uh, so I grew up in Uganda in a small town called Arua, which is in northern Uganda. And that's where I did all of my schooling up until GCSEs. So I was at um, a school called Taiba International School for uh, GCSEs. And after that, I then moved to the UK and I lived in South London in a place called Sutton, which some of you may have heard of if you're from London. And I went to Greenshaw High School and I did my A-levels in chemistry, biology, maths and further maths. <clears throat> And um, you can tell from this, I probably really liked maths. So I was trying to decide now what I wanted to do next. And I was I knew I wanted to go to university, but I didn't know whether I wanted to study maths or whether I wanted to study chemistry. Because I also had a real interest in chemistry, especially due to having some really great teachers who were very enthusiastic and like really made me very interested in the subject. And so I kind of looked into what I could study at university and I, I found there's not many options to study both chemistry and maths as a joint degree in the UK but that if I did find that if I studied chemistry I'd be able to do quite a bit of maths and there's often a maths course that you have to do as part of your chemistry degree whereas if I did a maths degree I would probably have to give up on the chemistry and so that kind of guided my decision that actually I wasn't ready to give up on chemistry and so that was what I wanted to study at university. <clears throat> So um, at this point, I'd done my A-levels um, and I kind of decided I want to stay in chemistry and that's what I want to study for my undergrad degree. So I applied to uni and I actually applied for what's called a deferred place. So that's where you apply for a place not to start kind of the S September as soon as you finish school, but to actually take a gap year and then start at your undergrad degree a year later with a, a year between finishing your A-levels and actually going to, to uni. And so that's what I did. And I was very lucky to get a place um, that allowed me to have a gap year. And on my gap year, I actually worked for the year at the Institute of Cancer Research, which is also in South London in a place called Belmont. And for me, that um, was a really good experience because it gave me a chance to work in chemistry research labs, which was something I already knew I was quite interested in. And having a whole year of research really helped when I came to start my undergrad degree that I actually had quite a bit of experience in it, which was beyond what I would have got directly from A-levels. But of course, the, the choice to take a gap year is very personal um, and lots of, lots of people take gap years to either travel, um, lots of people do take them to work or choose not to take a gap year at all and to go straight to university from your A-levels. And so that's something that like, if you're interested in is definitely worth doing and worked out really well for me doing a gap year. But of course, it's by no means the, the rule and it's quite common also to go straight um, to your undergrad degree from your A-levels. So after my uh, gap year, I then moved to Oxford to take up my place to study chemistry. And at Oxford, I was at Somerville College. So I, you may be a bit familiar with how the Oxford system works. So you have lots of different colleges and all the students are assigned to a college. And that's kind of where you will live, where um, you, you'll eat most of your meals in hall there. It's kind of where your community will be. So I was at Somerville College. And here is just a photo of the Somerville College Library, which is a beautiful building. And it was a lovely college to be a part of. And while there, I also took up rowing. So here there's a photo of me rowing for Somerville. And this is a brand new sport that I'd never done before. I did, had never even considered or thought I would enjoy, um, but something that I just picked up and discovered I really love. And six years later, I'm still rowing. So again, I would definitely recommend that wherever you go off to, whether that's university or not, if there's lots of if there's opportunities to take up things that you've not done before, it's definitely worth trying because you might find something you love, whether it's sport related or if it's in arts and drama. There's a lot of opportunities out there and it's definitely worth throwing yourself into it because you never know what you'll find. Uh, and then here is just a photo of me and one of my friends who's also doing chemistry on our matriculation day, which is um, what happens when you start at the university, you have this um, ceremony called matriculation. And we're just stood in front of the Radcliffe camera, which is one of Oxford's kind of iconic buildings. <clears throat> 
So what was the degree actually like? Um, so at Oxford, you study for an MChem, so a Master's in Chemistry. In your first year, you learn a lot of general chemistry, so that will be covering organic chemistry, inorganic chemistry and physical chemistry. And you also have this um, maths and a physics course, which, like I mentioned before, that was re really what um, kind of swayed my decision to study chemistry, was that I could still have some maths in the first year. And you'll generally be having lectures with your whole cohort, so about 200 other students in lecture halls that look like this. And then two afternoons a week, you will be in um, undergraduate teaching laboratories. So this is a photo of the teaching lab we have at Oxford, um, which is really new, it only opened a few years ago and has really good facilities. It's really state of the art teaching um, lab. So I was very lucky also to be able to um, be taught in such a, like a, such a good teaching environment. Um, you then move on to your second and your third year, which again is still a lot of general chemistry. So what's um, quite different about the course at Oxford is that you don't actually specialise very much over the um, three taught years of your course. You still study all the three branches of chemistry um, throughout and you do get the chance to have an options exam in your third year, but you still cover a wide range of general chemistry. And then for me, I actually did a summer project in between my third year and like my fourth year where I did just an internship in the labs at in the Department of Pharmacology still at Oxford, which just gave me a chance again to get a bit more lab experience as it was something I already kind of knew I'd enjoyed from doing my gap year. And then the fourth year at Oxford is kind of your master's year and that's a full year of a research project. So you'll join an active research group and be a full part of that group for the year. There's no lectures and there's no exams and you're fully just focusing on that research year. And I was in working in this building, which is the Chemistry Research Laboratory, and I was working with Professor Ed Anderson for that fourth year. So I'd finished my um, undergrad degree and then I had to decide what I wanted to do next. And I already knew that I really enjoyed working in a lab environment and I really enjoyed that problem solving aspect of research because um, I'd done it on my gap year and then I'd done it for that six week internship. And then the whole of my fourth year again was still organic um, research and I, and I discovered that was an environment I really was enjoying and I wasn't ready to leave yet. So um, I decided to apply for a PhD. And there's kind of two main routes into PhDs, I would say. So the first is a direct route where you would approach a supervisor whose work you're interested in um, and ask to work for them. And that's kind of the more traditional way to do it, to directly um, apply to a research group that you're interested in. But the way that I went for was actually going for what's called a doctoral training program. So this is more of a course and there'll be some taught lectures at the start of that program and then you will move on and do the research in, in the research groups. So I am on the chemistry in cells program and this program is very interdisciplinary. So although all my background was in chemistry and I'd done my chemistry undergrad degree, being on this course has actually made me um, branch into the field of biology a lot more. So I am still working in the same chemistry building and here is a photo of me uh, in the chemistry lab. But I also now work half of the time in a separate building, which is a biology lab, and I'm doing a lot more um, biology kind of work of growing cells and cell culture, which is a very new uh, experience and something that I've picked up only when I've started the PhD and I was quite lucky that I'm able to do that on this because I'm part of this kind of course where they teach you at the beginning all the skills you don't have so for me I learned a lot of biology in the beginning taught course and then now I'm able to actually work in a biology lab as well as the chemistry lab. So that's kind of an overview of how I got to where I am now um, so now I just I'm going to tell you a little bit about the actual research that I'm doing. And I'm working on um, a disease that's caused by a parasite and then I'm trying to actually discover how my compound is working in this parasite. So by way of an introduction, I'm working on a neglected tropical disease. And this is a group of diseases that have been classified by the World Health Organization as diseases that mainly occur in tropical areas, so the tropics of the world, and they are generally neglected, so underfunded and under-researched. So we don't really know much about them, but they are actually 
causing a big um, burden on uh, human life. And the disease that I'm looking at is leishmaniasis. <clears throat> now, most of you have probably never heard of leishmaniasis, and that's fine. I also had never heard of it until I started the PhD and began looking and working on it. And it's one of these, <clears throat> excuse me, it's one of these neglected tropical diseases. And it affects about 18 million people across the world. And you can see from this map, the areas in purple are where it's the biggest problem. So particularly a big problem in Brazil, um, some parts of sub-Saharan Africa, and then also India. And you can see it's very widespread and it is a big, um, a big issue. It's mostly presents as a skin disease. So it causes sores on the skin and this can then lead to um, lots of health, other health problems and disabilities and disfigurements. And it can also lead to death. So it's it's caused by this parasite and the parasite can then migrate. Once it's in the body, it can migrate to the liver and to the heart. And that starts to cause um, obviously heart failure, liver failure and can lead to death. So it is a very severe disease. And there are treatments for it. But the, all the current treatments are quite problematic. So lots of them are quite toxic, which means they have a range of like nasty side effects, which makes it harder to actually um, convince people to keep taking them. There's also starting to be a lot of resistance emerging. So the parasites are getting resistant to the current drugs that are on the market. So people end up relapsing with the disease. And also the current drugs are quite expensive. And you can also see from the the places where this disease is a big problem, they're generally in third world countries and the people being affected are actually not from a um, wealthy background. And so the cost of treatments is actually very prohibitive as well to fighting this disease. So you can see why uh, we need to be looking into it and we need to actually keep trying to improve and look for cures for this disease, leishmaniasis. So how does this disease work? It's, it's caused by a parasite called leishmania. And leishmania has two different life cycle stages. The first one is the promastigotes, which I've just drawn a cartoon of here. And it's a single cell. It has this kind of long cell body. It's got a nucleus, which is this little round bit. And then it's got one single mitochondrion. So unlike human cells, which you're probably more familiar with, uh, having multiple mitochondria, the leishmania just have a single one. And it's a very long kind of folded structure that takes up the whole cell body. They also have a flagellum here and that they can beat and use for swimming, a bit similar to how bacteria also have flagella and can swim. If you're if, if you're studying biology, you might be a bit familiar with some of these structures. Uh, Leishmania can also then differentiate into a different life cycle stage called amastigotes. These are actually much smaller than the promastigotes. I just had to draw it zoomed in so that you could actually see the, the features. Again, they still have the nucleus here uh, and the same folded mitochondrion, but the amastigotes don't have a flagellum. So these actually don't swim. They just kind of sit there. So now we know there's promastigotes and there's amastigotes that make up the leishmania, but how do these then get put together into a life cycle? Well, it's quite a, a complicated life cycle that involves uh, both, both a mammalian host and a sand fly. So the, the life cycle is actually quite similar to malaria, which you might be more familiar with. So I think most people are, are familiar with the idea that malaria is spread by mosquitoes. So when a mosquito bites someone, that person then can get malaria and that's how it's spread. So it's a very similar idea for leishmania, but they instead use sand flies. So if we start at the top here, you'll have a sand fly that's infected with leishmania promastigotes. This sand fly will bite a human and it will inject the promastigotes into the human bloodstream. So the promastigotes are now in the human body and inside the body, um, the human immune response will recognize that this is something foreign that needs to be got rid of. And so the macrophages, which is part of the immune response, will engulf the promastigotes, so we'll kind of swallow it up. And this is all a normal part of the immune response. So what's supposed to happen next is that macroph macrophage is supposed to destroy the leishmania. But instead, what happens here is the leishmania promastigote can change into the amastigote form, which is the much smaller form. And this form is really tough and hard to kill. So the macrophage actually isn't able to kill the leishmania. 
and instead the Leishmania amastigotes can grow inside it and multiply until eventually it causes the macrophage to burst open and release more amastigotes into the bloodstream. And then other macrophages can take those up and the process keeps, uh, the cycle continues. And then eventually, if another sandfly comes along and bites a human that's infected, they will take up these amastigotes. And the amastigotes will sit in the gut of the sandfly because that's where the, the blood meal will sit. And inside the gut, the amastigotes now convert themselves back into promastigotes which are the ones that are able to swim, and that enables them to swim from the gut of the sandfly up into the salivary glands, and then they're ready to get injected into another human. So you can see how the Leishmania have really evolved quite cleverly to be able to firstly evade the, the human immune system by hiding almost as these tough amastigotes that can't be killed, and then they can convert back into promastigotes to help them with the life cycle and to help the spread to other humans. So it's really quite a clever um, system that they have of differentiating between the two life forms. So now we've got this, this um, parasite, Leishmania, that's causing Leishmaniasis. And obviously we want to know how to cure it, how to get rid of these, this parasite. Um, so where do we look for inspiration? Well, as Ben um, mentioned before in his talk, that natural products are a really great source for drugs. And just to remind you all, what is a natural product? Well, a natural product is any chemical compound or substance that's produced by a living organism. And Ben talked you through a whole range of different natural product examples. So I'll also just go through a few, some of which are even the same example. So most of you will have heard of morphine, which is the painkiller which comes from poppies. You've got uh, another painkiller, aspirin, which comes from the bark of a willow tree and has been used for centuries um, as a painkiller. Penicillin, which uh, Ben gave us a nice intro to, comes from this fungi and is a very potent antibiotic. And then quinine is an anti-malarial example that comes from the bark of what were traditionally called fever trees. Um, and these have been used again for centuries, particularly this was this quinine tree um, is predominant in South America. And so lots of the traditional Amazon tribes would use this to treat fevers. And so you can see that like over or for centuries even, nature has been providing compounds that have drug properties, so are able to cure disease or have really good properties. So it makes sense for Leishmania to also look, for look to nature. And so this tree, the Nectandra leucantha, um, the, barks, uh, the bark and the leaves were crushed up and from it was extracted this compound here with this structure. And this compound was found to kill Leishmania. Uh, and just to explain a bit, I guess, about the, the, this, um, the chemical structure here, as Ben mentioned, it, I'm using skeletal formula and here where I write ME, that just means methyl, which means CH3 group. So instead of drawing out the CH3, I just write ME to mean methyl, but otherwise uh, it's just in skeletal formula, which hopefully you should now be familiar with. So we have this compound that we know kills the leishmania and is extracted from a plant. But it's again not very practical to always try and extract from nature when you need to use a compound. So the work of one of the PhD students before me was to actually find a synthesis route to make this in the lab. Uh, and she developed a route where we could just take starting material you can buy and in the lab make quite big quantities of this compound that kills the leishmania. So now that this has been established, this is where my project comes in and I want to know how does this compound work? It's all well and good to say that it's killing the leishmania cells, but we want to know what's actually going on. So how does any drug work? Well, generally you'll have your drug compound and that's going to interact with some protein of interest. And at this point, we don't know what protein is being interacted with. Um, we don't know what it's causing. All we know is that the end result is it's killing the leishmania. So I want to start to probe into this and figure out a bit more of what is actually going on. And I'm planning to use microscopy to find out exactly or narrow down a little bit more on what's happening here. 
So just to take a step back and think about microscopy and kind of scales of things, <clears throat> what I have here is just a, a scale in nanometers of different sized things. So on the kind of biggest end, you've got something like a tennis ball that we all know you're very easy to see with the naked eye. You can see a tennis ball. Coming a bit smaller down to 10 to the 6 nanometers, we've got salt grains, which are a lot smaller than a tennis ball, but you're still able to make those out with the naked eye. And then uh, the human eye can see down to about 10 to the 5 nanometers, but a leishmania is only 10 to the 4. So you're not actually able to see an individual leishmania cell um, just with the naked eye. So that's why I'm going to need to use microscopy. So with a light microscope, that massively increases what you can see. So now with light microscopy, you're actually able to see each individual Leishmania cell. And then you've got a range of things getting smaller. So you've got viruses, which are really small. Your DNA, which of course you know is, is like, you, there's no way you're gonna be able to see a DNA or protein individually. And then right at the kind of smallest end, we've got compounds, which are made up of just a few individual atoms. And so there's no way, obviously, you're going to be able to see this even with microscopy. So then how am, how am I going to use microscopy to answer my question? Well, the solution is to actually use fluorescence. So what I can do is I can take my compound that's killing the leishmania and I can attach a red dye to it, which I've just labelled as this little red blob. And that way, if I then shine um, red light onto the compound that has the dye, the dye will emit um, some red fluorescence and then you could capture the fluorescence. So without needing to actually see the physical um, compound itself, you can just capture the lights being given off by it using this little red dye. And so that's exactly what I've done. So I've taken my Leishmania cells and I've treated them with this compound, which has now the red dye on it. I then put that on a microscope slide, so stick the cells down to the slide and I put that on our fancy microscope. Uh, so we have quite a good microscope set up in the lab. You put your slide onto the kind of platform here. It's got a camera attached to it, so that's going to capture the images of whatever's on the slide. And then what I do is I shine this red light onto the slide. And because the compound has that red dye on it, it's going to fluoresce, and then I'm going to take an image and capture it. And what I see in my images is now I can see each individual Leishmania cell because we know from the scale that with light microscopy, I'm able to see each individual cell. And then also I'm going to get a signal that comes from the red light being emitted, so that fluorescence light. And that then will enable me to look inside the cell and see where that fluorescence signal is coming. And then on the other side, if I didn't have that red dye, so here if you don't have the red dye, you treat with just the compound, even if you go through all the same steps and you shine the red light on the slide, there's now no dye, so nothing's going to emit the fluorescence. And so the image you capture, you can still see the individual Leishmania cells, but there's no bright signal to tell you where the compound is. So what does this actually look like? So here is my result. On the left, I'm showing what it looks like if I don't have the red dye. So just my compound. I'm treating it with each individual Leishmania cell. So this, these are photos of Leishmania cells. And in here is what you would see when you shine red light on it. And I don't see anything. Now, if we come to this panel on the right, I've got my compound, which now has the red dye. And here you can already see there's a red signal that comes from shining the red light on it. And in these two panels here, this is what it looks like if I show you just, just the picture that happens if you take um, from shining red light on it. And I've converted it into um, black and white just because that makes it easier to see, especially on a, a PowerPoint presentation. But you can immediately see that there's a signal there. So now um, I need to figure out what this signal is. Well, if I take you back to the cartoon that I had of my Leishmania Promastigo, we can already see that if it was the nucleus, I would expect a small round kind of spot in the middle of the cell body. And that's definitely not what I'm seeing. Again, if it was the flagellum, it would be quite obvious. You would have this long kind of tail signal coming off the back of the cell, um, and that's not the signal that I see. So what I do see is actually the mitochondrion. So my cartoon um, image doesn't quite capture the, the full foldedness of the mitochondrion, but this is actually what a Leishmania mitochondrion looks like. So it's this kind of folded signal that takes up most of the cell body. 
so the day that um, we got this result was actually a very exciting time that we were able to see where this compound is inside the cell. And now we have that knowledge that this compound is actually acting by interacting with uh, the cell mitochondria. So to, to obviously get to that result, I needed my compound with the, the red dye attached. And it's all very easy to just say you make that and then you put it on the cells. But how do you actually make that? So I obviously had to make it myself in the lab. And this is where I needed to rely on all my past chemistry knowledge. So from right from A-level and all the undergraduate teaching means then you start to understand how different things can react. So the route that I chose to make it was to take the active compound itself and to react it with this blue um, linker is what I call it. And here TS just stands for tosyl and tosyl next to an oxygen becomes a very good leaving group. So what that means is that if you react these two things together, this OH on here, so the phenol, can attack this position, the tosyl oxygen will fall off because it's a leaving group. Um, and what you end up with is this in the middle. So you've got your, your active compound and then you've got a linker attached to it. And then the next uh, chemical step I did was to use this linker. So this here is a C triple bond C, so an alkyne. And if you react that, with an azide, which is an N3, so three nitrogens in a row, what you end up with is uh, this functional group, which is called a triazole, and that's a, way, a good way to attach those two things together. And this was how I was actually able to attach my red dye to my active compound. And this again is, is quite where it's quite important to understand what different things can react together. So you might think, for example, I could have attached my active compound directly to the red dye without needing that blue link a bit in the middle. But when you actually come down to look at the chemistry of it, it's not possible to attach an N3 directly to an OH. So you, that's why you need this kind of blue linker. So you have to take all these things into account when you're designing how you're going to make the compound. And then practically, what does that look like? So Ben already showed you a bunch of really nice looking pictures of what it's like to work in the lab. So here's just a few more. Um, and so if you're going about doing a chemical reaction, the first thing you need to do is mix together the things that you want to react. And that you'll generally do in a round bottom flask like this. Um, and you normally have a stir bar in there. So it kind of stirs and you leave that going until the reaction is finished. Once the reaction's finished, you'll have your product in there. So the compound that you wanted to make. But normally you'll also have a bunch of um, maybe side products or um, unreacted starting material, stuff you don't actually want uh, that's just kind of gunk that's in there. So you're going to need to purify it. So the first thing you do is generally what we call a workup. So that's what you when you do what you do in a, a separating funnel. So you put your compound and or your product and that will be dissolved normally in an organic solvent. So you'll put that in there and then you'll add water to it. And the water and organic solvent won't mix. So it's uh, like oil and water not mixing. And that means any any gunk that's in there that can dissolve in the water can actually get washed out in the separating funnel. So you can remove a whole lot of um, impurities that dissolve in the water and your compound that you want will stay in the organic layer. Uh, so once you've done that, at this point, if you're lucky, you'll have your clean compound uh, and your clean product and you can move on with it. But often there's still some other impurities in there that weren't able to dissolve in the water, so it weren't able to be washed out. So then you have to do what's called column chromatography. So that's where you fill this glass column with a very fine powder called silica, and you put your mixture of compounds on the top. So it will be probably mostly your product that you want, and there'll be a few other impurities still in there. And then you do this column chromatography. So you run a solvent down it, and that will separate everything out everything that's in the mixture out into its separate components. So it's quite similar again to what Ben was mentioning and to the kind of color chromatography you probably did at school. I think it's quite a common GCSE experiment where you'll put like a dot of a Sharpie on some paper and then run the water up it and see all the different colors that make up, say, a black Sharpie. It's the exact same principle here. You separate out your mixture into all its different individual things. And at the end, hopefully you'll have your lovely clean product that you're trying to make either as crystals or a solid or an oil, depending on exactly what it was. 
So now you've made your compound, or in my case, I've made my compound. Now I need to actually test it on the cells. So how do we how do we grow these leishmania parasites? So we grow them in this red media, and in the media we add um, some proteins and serums and just things to encourage the growth and to try and mimic the kind of natural environment that these parasites would grow in. So we also keep them in an incubator that's at 28 degrees for the promastigotes. That's because the body of a sandfly is at 28 degrees, so it's just trying to mimic their natural growth. And you can grow them either in flasks or you can grow them on 96 well plates like I'm showing here. And in this, every well will be filled with some medium and in the medium we'll have you'll have the parasites growing. And that just depends on what experiment you're trying to do, whether you grow them in flasks or in plates. And all of the Leishmania work is done in a category three level lab. So that means you need to work always inside a microbial safety cabinet, which is uh, one of these. And that just has an airflow that makes sure that in case you're, you spill anything, it's all contained within the cabinet and the airflow means that nothing can escape. And that's because these Leishmania are a human pathogen. They are a human infected parasite. And so we obviously have to work in a very safe way to ensure that there's no danger to me when I'm working with them. <clears throat> and then here I'm just showing some more photos of Leishmania. So this is an image that I've captured with lots of the Leishmania promastigos just stuck down on a slide. And this here should hopefully be a video. I don't know how well it's coming across, but hopefully you can see the Leishmania swimming across the screen here. Um, yeah, and there's another little one coming there. And so they beat their flagellum, and this is how they're able to swim. Um, and what's quite interesting is actually they swim in the direction of the flagellum. So it's not like a tail, it's more like a propeller leading them forward, which I thought was very interesting when I first saw them swim, that it was kind of counterintuitive to what I thought they would swim like. Um, so yeah, that's what they look like when they're freely swimming. Uh, so kind of let's bring it all back to like, what is the point? Why am I doing this? Why is this important? So if you remember, the whole idea is that this compound is interacting with some protein. <clears throat> Um, and before before I started my work, we didn't know what was going on. We just knew that it killed the parasite. Then based on my results, we now have this knowledge that this is the signal that comes from the compound. And that's telling us that this compound is interacting in the mitochondrion. And this is the kind of information that can then be passed on to other chemists, especially in pharmaceutical companies. And they now can know that, for example, this specific protein is a good target and that if you target that you're actually able to kill leishmania so this is all this kind of research then contributes to the wider picture of um, pharmaceutical companies trying to make drugs against leishmaniasis so in conclusion um hopefully i've given you a little bit of an idea of what it's like to do chemistry at the university of oxford and then also specifically in my project, what it's like using chemistry as a tool to help you understand biology and what it's like working with parasites and that they're actually really very cool and very interesting. And with that, I just wanna also point out that research is a team effort. And so um, you, even though you might be the only one working on your specific project, you'll have all your work colleagues around you for support and advice. And so I'd also like to thank uh, all my colleagues and um, particularly Professor Ed Anderson here, who runs the chemistry group where I do all that synthesis and making the compounds. And then Dr. Richard Wheeler, who is here on the right, um, and he runs the biology lab. So he, where I'm doing all that leishmania work um, and cell culture work. And so with that, I'd like to thank you all for listening. And I'm very happy to take any questions. So please just pop those in the Q&A and then I can go through and answer those. <clears throat>